Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of In the Spotlight. I'm really excited tonight because we have a very special guest. I've followed their career since I was probably 12 years old. Who can forget her on the new Gidget? Who can forget her is Nora Brady on the Brady's. But folks, she's done a number of things in her life. Um, she's also very involved in several charitable things, especially, you know, with rescuing animals. She's just a wonderful person. And it is really my honor to introduce the In the Spotlight, Miss Karen Richmond. And Karen, I want to thank you for coming on today. It's a real honor. Oh, Mike, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for that beautiful introduction. I'm not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, you are. But um, Karen, let me ask you this, because a lot of times people's um, actors loves for the business, it begins at a young age. But really what happened to you, if I'm not mistaken, is you had went to school for social work. And by chance, you got a great audition uh, on Broadway to do Grease and play uh, Sandy. So just talk about that a little bit. Wow. Well, I grew up on Long Island, very sort of traditional upbringing. And the plan was for me to go to college and get my degree in social work, which is what I wanted to do. But my very, very first love was always acting. So you know, I did act in in high school, in college, you know, community theater, that kind of thing. There was this open call on Broadway for Greece. And in those days, you had what was, you know, um, lovingly called cattle calls, where you literally went down, there were hundreds of people, you didn't necessarily need an agent, but you did get to stand on the Broadway stage, which for me always dreaming of, you know, having a Broadway career and singing into my hairbrush as a little girl pretending I was Barbara Streisand and funny girl or, or any of that. I thought I'm going to go stand on that Broadway stage. I have, oh, there's a picture of Barry Williams and I coming up on screen. Um, I love him, by the way. He's such a sweet soul, such a nice person. We can talk about him. No yeah. doubt. Yeah. But anyway, long story short, um, I went to New York. Um, I was from New York, but I was going to school in Syracuse. I stood on that Broadway stage just as I imagined. I was in awe. And two months later, it was a long process. Um, I was finally cast as Sandy in the National Touring Company, um, ended up doing a short run on Broadway before it closed. And um, it truly taught me a wonderful lesson because I wasn't going to get the job. Every audition after that, you know, actors desperately want to get cast. They want to work. So in that instance, it, the goal was not to get the job. The goal was to just have that experience. And so it was much more innocent for me. And, and I think I was Sandy, quite honestly, I was absolutely in awe of standing on that stage. So and that started me off. And then I realized, oh, my goodness, I could actually do my first love, my first passion and maybe make a living at it. I, I didn't know where it would lead, but that was certainly my first step. So, Right. And talk to me a little about Broadway, uh, Karen, because it's, you know, when you're doing a TV series or you're doing a film, you're rehearsing all the time, but you're never really going live. You're going to record it. It's going to eventually go on to the big screen or the TV set. But when you're doing Broadway, you got to go live every night for, you know, sometimes they do it for like a month at a time, two months at a time, and you're doing the same thing over and over. I mean, was there any nerves at that young age every time you went out there? Oh, my gosh. To this day. I mean, here's the difference. I think many actors will say that theater is the ultimate acting experience because it's like getting on a roller coaster. And once you start going, there's no stopping. There's anything that happens on that stage for that period of time. There's no, so no one yelling cut, no one saying, let's do another take. It is absolutely your journey, but you also get to be that person that you're playing straight through that first act until intermission. And it's exciting because you're in it, hopefully, and living it so for such a long period of time compared to doing film and television where it's in little segments and sometimes completely out of sequence and you're filming the last part before the first part kind of thing. Um, so it really is, at least 
for me, I will only speak for myself at the moment, but I know other actors feel so similarly. It's the most exciting thing you can possibly do. It's live. Yeah. Like, no matter what happens, I know I'm repeating myself. And doing it every night um, or repeating it, I think if you're really in it, you can only hope that each night it's new. You're saying the same lines, you're doing the same movements, but you're getting different things from your fellow actors. You're in that moment, hopefully living this real life of this character. And sometimes a glass spills and sometimes you trip and sometimes you forget a line. And so you're always, it is a new experience every single time. Similarly, I would say with filming, it's true that every take is a different experience in the same way. Um, the goal is for not to repeat anything, but just be in that moment living a real life of that person that you're embodying, you know, um, hopefully that's the goal. <laughs> and interestingly enough, Karen, um, the funny thing about how it all went about is, again, you were going to school for social work and you just decided to leave school and your parents said to you, what are you, crazy or whatever? But really, when you get down to it, they were very supportive throughout your career. And that's the biggest thing is that you had two supportive parents who always backed you up all the time and um, always encouraged you to live your dreams. I did. I, I'll, 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 I'm thinking about it as you're saying it. Um, you know, I had the most supportive. Oh, that's my mama. Oh my, <laughs> I love the pictures that you're putting up. Thank you, hi, mama. Uh -huh. um, my mom wanted to be an actress, but she grew up, you know, in a time where traditionally. Oh my gosh, where did you get all these pictures? I'm gonna cry. How beautiful, my mom. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, she, my mom, you know, did community theater. I, my dad told me this story that when I was about two years old, I was watching her on stage and I screamed out, that's my mommy, you know? And, and so I think for my mom, especially, she was very, very excited. My dad supported me no matter what my decisions were, but I'm not sure, to be honest, that he agreed with my decision um, at that time. He wanted a more traditional life for me. He knew that choosing acting was not a traditional way to go, was not guaranteed that you're going to work and be happy and have a fulfilled life. And, you know, we all know in any artistic um, setting, when we set out to be an artist, there's heartache that, that comes along with it. But ultimately, um, as I gained some success, I think my dad, you know, sighed with relief that I was on the road to making a career and not necessarily going to have to, you know, be doing all kinds of other things while I was pursuing my art form. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And certainly we all do that throughout our careers. But early on, I enjoyed enough success that I think everybody sort of just let go of any preconceived <laughs> notions of what they wanted for me and went with it. Um, and I was grateful for that. Right. And Karen, you know, one of the things in life, and we all go through it, but we have to, you know, persevere and things of that nature. And the thing about it is, is we look back when we're like in school and we say to ourselves, if we had to do it all over again, we do di things differently. We wouldn't be so worried about what this person thought or trying to be cool or things like that. Because I know like in high school, especially for you, you had went through some challenges emotionally, not just with yourself, but, you know, with friends, family and things like that. But I really think that it all, you know, reverts back because that is why you've been able to be so successful because you understand that since you were a little kid, there's always been challenges. Ooh. Well, that, you know, life, life is a lot to unpack sometimes. Right. And, and, and I'm the first one to say that in my early years, um, I think it was actually my early acting training, to be honest, because 
I was living a life internally that was not nearly as happy as my facade was. So, and again, it's not a sob story by any means. I had wonderful parents and a beautiful upbringing, but my parents were divorced. I was three at the time. Um, there was a lot of, you know, going back and forth, trying to make sense as a child. Um, I had a brother, my brother, uh, was diagnosed as a schizophrenic later on in life, but early on, you know, was having emotional difficulties and life is not always what it seems, right? And so then you're in school and you're trying to be popular and you're trying to fit in and you're trying to be, um, you know, my facade was always perky, sweet, wholesome, everybody's friend trying to fit in everywhere because that was sort of my psychology. Um, from a very early age, because I had mommy and daddy in two separate places. And so making sense of that as a young person, I'm not sure I really realized it in the moment. But when I look back, I realize, you know, I wish I had just trusted that we don't have to try to fit in, which is an impossible lesson. You cannot tell somebody in middle school or high school or even elementary school for that matter, you know, don't try to fit in because that's so much what we're yearning for as young people. But in retrospect, I wish I had just allowed myself to be. And if I, I wasn't smiley and perky and everybody's best friend, that was okay. Um, there was a lot of energy being invested in being liked and being popular, whatever the heck that is. I mean, what is that? You know, um, there's always people that don't like us. There's always people that, you know, whatever. We, we, we're just here to be the best versions of ourselves, I guess. And I didn't trust that as a, as a young person. I just was trying to be everything to everybody. And that honestly was exhausting. However, I will say this, um, that facade, that persona, I've played so many characters based on that energy that I really did perfect as a kid. Um, the role of Gidget, for instance, you know, the, the perkiest, most wholesome role you could ever imagine, possibly, um, you know, very much mirrored my facade. You know, everything's fine, everything's cheery. Um, I loved playing Gidget, but I. this is an aside, um, not really on point, but what I'm finding now as an old person, as an older person, um, you know, the roles I'm playing now are, are much more interesting to me in certain ways because I'm no longer playing the ingenue. Now I'm playing characters, abused characters, mean characters. You know, yay, I get to be like mean. And I have that in me. So, yay, I have to do that. Um, yeah, but trying to stay on topic. Um, I wish I could have trusted more that wherever I was and whoever I was was okay. Um, and certainly it's something I wish for any young person who is agonizing. I can't even imagine, honestly, today's, you know, being young today with social media, you know, as an adult, I have trouble thinking, oh my God, my life's not happy enough or perfect enough because everybody on social media is perfect. The best pictures, the best, they're the happiest, they're the most successful. No one's posting pictures of themselves depressed and miserable eating a pint of ice cream. And sometimes I wish we did because we would you know, have a stronger sense of we're all human. We're all, we have wonderful, beautiful, joyful moments in life, as you well know. And we have heartbreakingly sad, you know, depressing, challenging moments in life. And it's all part of it. And one of the reasons, Karen, if I'm not mistaken, you opened an act in school was not, you know, mainly to teach them the rules of acting, but also it was about building character, confidence, things of that nature. Um, so talk about that a little bit, because I know that was a big thing for you. It was kind of like getting you to feel good about who you are and believing in, you know, the person that you are. Mike, I am so impressed. You and I have never talked. I, I need people out there, whoever's listening, to understand that you, you know so much. And I'm so grateful that you really... Um, 
took the time and the trouble to know more, uh, you know, about me than I ever expected. Thank you. Thank you for no that. Problem. That means a lot. I, yeah. So for me, in keeping with that discussion, you know, acting, I had a love of therapy and what drives people internally and our emotional challenges. And that's why I was drawn to psychology and social work in college. And then I ended up sort of doing an external um, representation of, you know, how, what human nature is. Acting is trying to understand what drives characters and why are they saying what they're saying and doing what they're doing. And one of the things for me in thinking about my childhood was that I wish someone had given me support and uh, permission to celebrate the ways in which I didn't fit in, to celebrate the things that made me, me. And I want to pass that on to young people. So acting, you know, when you're teaching acting or public speaking, especially on an elementary school level, um, where it all sort of starts, when you have a teacher that's saying, oh my gosh, do, you know, give me who you are, 150%. We don't want you to be like anybody else. We want you to be the best version of yourself. That's so cool that you do this and that person doesn't do that. Or you feel this and they feel differently. How great is that? You know, we're not, I wasn't necessarily taught that. So that was a big goal in starting um, it's an, actually an after-school enrichment acting program. Uh, we go into the school system. We teach on campus. And um, I'm lucky enough to have some amazing teachers, but we all come from the same mission statement, which is to celebrate, as corny as it might sound, um, ourselves authentically as people um, and to just let it fly, you know, when, and don't censor and come on, just do it. Just let yourself go, you know, that kind of thing, which we're not really taught that in school. We have to obey, you know, we have to raise yeah. our hands and we have to do all that. And that, of course, you need to do that. You'd have utter chaos if you were sitting in a, a math class and everybody was being their crazy selves. <laughs> but yes, yes. Thank you for asking all these good questions. Yeah. So um, one of the first uh, big roles you got, and I, I feel like so many, you know, successful actors have always started out in soap operas and you were on a series called Texas. And I think it, it lasted a few years. And I think you did about, I would say, 244 episodes somewhere along there. But um, I mean, that was really huge. And I think that was like a spinoff from another world. So another world at the time was very popular. But just talk about working in soap operas because, I mean, that's on Monday through Friday. It's not a once a week show. So, I mean, yet they give the different actors days off and things like that. But you're really working a lot and there is no break in the summer as well. No, I mean, the thing to me that I am so grateful for was I, I really learned how to be on a set from doing the soap. And, and many actors that do soap operas talk about that. There's not a lot of time on soap operas. So it is up to you to take tons of dialogue, you know, every single day. Sometimes they'll change it five minutes before they're yelling action. Um, you have to get it very nimble, very um, adept. And there's nothing like a soap opera to help you hone that craft because it's a huge challenge. I'm not sure um, if people are not, you know, really that aware of the process of how many pages a day soap operas film compared to, you know, let's say an hour drama that they might be watching at night on television. Um, we would do pages and pages of dialogue each day. And you get very comfortable with your fellow castmates. You get to the point where you become more of a well-oiled machine because you're working so much. Um, but believe me, I look back on, on some of my work, especially early on on Texas, and think, Woo, boy, did you need an acting class. <laughs> so, 
boy, boy, was that overly dramatic in that moment. But, but then I also saw that as I learned more from my fellow actors and just from doing it every day and sometimes watching it back and seeing what worked, you know, and what didn't work, um, I, that was the greatest training ground ever. And we all had a really, really good time. It was such a great cast. We were also filming in the same studio in Brooklyn, New York, uh, as Another World. So we were this little soap opera conglomerate. You know, we had one studio, Another World was filming. We were over here, Texas was filming. We, you know, we all saw each other. Um, we all rented houses out in the Hamptons that summer. It was very la di da, but, you know, we all got very, close and it was really quite fun quite fun and soaps man those actors they have my complete respect and admiration it's it's tough and the funny thing about soap operas karen is no matter how crazy the storylines are people will still watch because i mean you know in soap operas you can die <laughs> in times and come back to life and you know they can <laughs> there's so yes. many storylines where you're like, okay, this would never happen in real life. But I think sometimes that's good for an audience because sometimes the audience, you know, in real life, you have to deal with things you don't really want to. In soap operas, you could just be like, okay, this may happen, but a, a happy ending will come out of it. So I always felt like that's what soap operas did for fans. Yeah. I, I, and it's very true. It's funny. It's amazing what the fans will accept. Um, in terms of storylines, in terms of, you know, characters coming back from the dead or twin sisters, brothers coming back. I know I did a very short stint on Young and the Restless yeah. where Tracy Bregman uh, is, a, is a character. She played the character of Lauren. She's still playing the character. She's a goddess on Young and the Restless. But while she had a baby in real life and was on maternity leave, I replaced her for a few episodes and that was the producer's choice to do that as opposed to, you know, creating a storyline where she was out for a bit. And that's kind of bizarre, too. They would, like, announce the role of Lauren. I forgot her last name at the moment. But um, normally played by Tracy Bregman is being played by, you know, Karen Richmond today. That's, that's a strange choice. But yet it worked. They bought it. I had a blast. And, uh, yeah, soap operas they have really some interesting storylines for sure. Yeah, most definitely. Um, fast forward in a little bit here, Karen. Um, I wanted to talk about this because again, it. I always felt like that not only are, are you a great actress, but you do so much with trying to help kids and stuff with the community. And another show that you did, I think you did about, I wanna say 10 to 12 episodes was The Adventures of Mr. Clown. And that was a real cool series because um it had a lot to do with, you know, schoolwork and things of that nature. So talk about that show and doing that a little oh bit. My God. Mike, I want to hire you as my manager right now on the spot. Thank you. Um, so Mr. The Adventures of Mr. Clown, that's um, a wonderful series where uh, a very good friend, his name is Tom Caltabiano, has this puppet Mr. Clown, um, and Tom is a brilliant writer. He wrote on Everybody Loves Raymond for years and um, was part of the production staff for that as well. Um, and uh, in this, he has Mr. Clown doing a number of different little series. Mine was called Manners, and it's all designed to lovingly, with a sense of humor, teach young kids manners, things like talking on the phone at the table, um, saying, please, you know, um, how to, all kind, you know, there were uh, 10 to 12 episodes, I think you're absolutely right, as I recall, you know, covering your mouth when you sneeze, all kinds of cute things. And Mr. Clown, Tom works this puppet like it's his, him, you know, he's so lifelike as far as his um, personality. And I actually found myself interacting with the puppet and really <laughs> reacting from him. It's beautiful. The puppet's amazing. Tom is amazing. And um, yes, it's a, it was a, a cause near and dear to my heart to be able to, you know, <clears throat> bring some sense of, um, you know, manners 
it's not something that I, I hope I don't get slammed for saying this, but I, I'm old enough that I was brought up in an era where manners were very, very important. Um, and there was no pushback. You know, if my parents said, you sit at the table until everybody is done, we sat at the table. Nobody excused themselves. You know, we were polite, respectful. We were brought up that way. Otherwise, it was unacceptable for us not to be. I think today kids have so much more freedom in general. I'm not saying everybody. It's just a whole different world today. Yeah. Um, and so to be maybe a small part and to do it with love and humor, with a with a beautiful clown puppet, you know, and to be able to hopefully have kids pay attention for a second, maybe that was quite fun. That was fun. And and those are the things too, Karen, where you. You know, there's a little acting involved, but really you're able to be yourself and you're able to have fun. And when you could, and I'm sure a lot of stuff you do, you have fun. So, you know, it's not like you're going to the studio and saying, oh, I got to do this today. But it's always nice when you could love your job, because a lot of times in life, people don't love their jobs. So when you could do something you love, I mean, that's got to make it even more rewarding. Yes, I think sometimes... Whenever I'm driving to a set, to this day, I'm really quite, for lack of a better word, moved um, that I'm getting to do what I love and I would do it for free. I mean, please don't tell my agents <laughs> or, or anybody for that matter. But, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. For those of us that are lucky enough to, work at something that is our heart and our soul it, it probably doesn't get any better than that and my work it's a hard profession you know there's no getting around that um people get lucky but you know and and of course talent is is part of it but there's so many circumstances out of control out of our control as actors and even getting a series if you're blessed enough to get on a series you know then it's how successful is that series if Gidget let's say had been friends or you know I don't know mad about you or any you know everybody loves Raymond or any of those series that became superstar series that were just unbelievably successful I would be in a different place not that I don't love doing, you know, I loved doing Gidget, but nobody knows as an actor how successful or unsuccessful your projects are going to be. So there's a lot of, you know, factors in, in, you know, being able to work as an actor. And, and there's a so much rejection, so much disappointment that you, you really do have to love it more than anything in the world. Otherwise, I don't, I don't wish it on someone if it's not something you love. If you love it, it's all wonderful. And if you keep a great attitude, that's helpful. But I'm not going to lie. There are times where I'm just like, oh, please tell me I got that part. You know, and they, there are so many instances where, you know, they love you. They love you. You're first in line for this part. You know, and in your mind, you're like, okay, I'm doing this role. And then you find out, oh, no, they cast it with somebody else. And, you know, there's so many disappointments, um, but then there's so much joy. So I guess it's just full circle, our discussion about life, you know, it, there's ups and downs. It's great. It stinks. <laughs> it's, it's all part of it. And let me ask you this, Karen, because I always was curious about this. Um, a lot of times you have to do guest spots and, you know, you have to go on the set of a show like Party of Five for one episode. And is there ever any, are you ever intimidated because you're going on a show where these people are with each other every day and you're kind of guest star and, you know, maybe one or two episodes on their show and you've got to get to learn to know the part that you're doing and the characters that they do. I mean, is there ever a time where you're like, oh, this is a little overwhelming? Yes. I mean, thank you for knowing that. Yeah. I, I've done some guest star spots back in the day that we were doing Gidget, it was still in the time, during the times where 
the studio itself would put you in a lot of the other shows that they had running. It doesn't really happen anymore, or maybe it does. I, I'm not actually sure. But when I was doing Gidget, I had the privilege of guest starring on a lot of different shows with some big name people. Um, and then after that, you know, not only during that time, I've done a number of guest stars throughout my career. Um, you're always, I always feel a bit intimidated. I am not part of their daily routine. They have an energy going, they have a rhythm with each other, they know each other. And most of the time, everybody's unbelievably welcoming and they recognize the fact that guest stars are an important part of the show for a short period of time. And it's helpful to the entire project if they're welcoming and helpful. Um, but sometimes they're not. And I, I've had some bad experiences where um, most of the time back then I played a lot of victim roles where I was the innocent and lots of tears and, you know, lots of emotion. And there was one show in particular where the star did not do, he did shot his close up, but when it came to shooting my close up, he went to his dressing room and the script supervisor was reading his part. Um, forgive me for not mentioning the name because it's not worth it. And, and nobody needs to know the specifics, but um, but now everybody's saying, who was it? Who was it? <laughs> no. um, and it was, I'm, it was difficult because I had to have tears and emotion and I didn't have him. So we weren't reenacting the scene. And for people watching, I'm making, I'm, I'm making the false assumption that people understand what I'm talking about, but the, the, the general overview here is that when you're doing a scene, usually they're doing a long shot, which is two people talking, let's say, and then they're going to come in with the camera for your close up for when you see closer shots on a TV show. And the person, you're not replaying the scene as you shot it, in the longer shot, now they're adjusting your you as actors so that the camera can get a shot. It still looks like it's the same, but it's tricky. And usually your other actor is right off camera so that you are looking at him, but the camera's getting you in a close up. So if you don't have the actor that you played that whole scene with, um, and you're working with someone who's not even an actor, who's reading from a script with their head in the script, that's that's very difficult. That's hard to do. So that that wasn't fun. But yes, so it is intimidating. I'm, I feel like I'm giving you the longest answers to your questions. I'm not uh, sure. No if problem at all. Believe me, it's a lot of fun. So okay, don't just don't worry about that. Tell me if I'm talking too much. I'll be quiet. So, um, Karen, 1985, you do the Gidget movie, and I think probably initially you cast members, you're you're thinking it's a movie. You don't expect it to be. Uh, you know, a reboot type series, but it does so well. You know, the movie had great reviews, which, you know, I think even Cisco and Ebert gave it good review. That's saying something because those guys can be tough. But um, let me ask you, I mean, that part was tremendous and you did an awesome job with it, but you're trying to play a new version of Gidget and Sally Field had been successful with that part and she's so popular and things like that. Again, that's got to be something that had to be, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, keep using this word, but intimidating because now you've got to try to give an audience the new version of Gidget when they were so used, you know, the older people were so used to the Sally Field character. So talk about that a little bit. Um, yes, to everything you said. Um, but honestly, I made all oh, William Schaller. Yeah, did play. a great job playing your father in that series. I mean, you two had tremendous chemistry and what a phenomenal actor he was. You know, what you see is what you got with him. And I feel so lucky that I got to work with him. He was so generous, so funny, so you know, um, in, invested in our relationship off screen, um, on screen. And we were friends till the day, you know, he passed. We saw each other way after the show was finished over the years. We would have lunch once or twice a year. And I really felt 
like we had sort of this paternal, he, he was a father figure for me in some ways. And we had a beautiful relationship. I'm so, so happy that I got to know him. Um, and as far as Gidget, so, you know, I really tried, um, I didn't realize how intimidating it should have felt. I think I was just naive and living in the moment. Um, the good news was Gidget was now an adult. So we I wasn't trying to reenact what Sally Field chose to do. And she's brilliant and was brilliant then as a young person. I had the luxury of knowing that now we were asking the audience to believe that this was that character, um, you know, 15 years later. So I had the chance to make her um, my own in that respect. And I think the, the qualities of Gidget, you know, I'm the seventh actress to have played Gidget. Um, it started with Sandra D back as a movie. There were all kinds of other movies. Gidget goes to Hawaii, Gidget goes to Rome, Karen yeah. Valentine played her. Um, I mean, I could list them if I really tax my brain and tell you all the actresses, but either which way, um, it was a role that, that at its very core, Gidget is um, perky, wholesome, optimistic, um, spirited in some ways, you know, she was was kind of ahead of her time back in the day because there was almost a feminist quality about her. She didn't care that all the surfers were boys. She was going to make her way in a man's world. You know, if you really want to like delve into it, we did a Gidget documentary and we talked a lot about that character, Gidget, who was based on a real life person. Kathy Zuckerman is her name. Um, she moved here from with her family from Eastern Europe, and she would go down to the beach in Malibu and come home and tell her dad about all the adventures she was having. And her dad ultimately wrote the book, um, Gidget, and it was ultimately made into a movie uh, with Sandra D playing the character. I... I just did my best with the material and to just make sure that I had the spirit of what I thought Gidget had, you know. Um, it wasn't until after the fact, I think, that I looked back and said, wow, you you really didn't freak out about doing that. I should have, yeah. but I, was, I think I was naive enough, to be honest, <laughs> or, um, or also nervous. Um, that was a, an, the movie of the week that we did, Gidget Summer Reunion, um, was one kind of a genre. It was more reality based. Um, it was a two hour movie, but it was, um, we weren't pushing for laughs in that two hour uh, movie of the week. When we were picked up for the series, The New Gidget, all of a sudden, um, we were doing a different kind of a show. It was much bigger. It was more cartoon-like. We had a laugh track. Um, I got to have this amazing experience as an actor to play different characters in every episode where I talk straight to the audience in some sort of costume. And the theme had something to do with what the story was that, that week but that was the most fun an actor could possibly have. I mean, I played everything from Elvira for a Halloween, you know, episode to, to um, old world English school marm to, to Indiana Jones. I mean, each week I was a different character with different accents and it was heaven. It really was a wonderful experience, but um I am talking ear off, not sure I answered your question, but I wasn't as intimidated as I should have been. That's my my really short answer. When I look back on it, um, I think I should have given it more thought, but I really was more in the moment of um, really just trying to make it my own and have her, how would she be 15, you know, 15 years later as a grown up, trying to deal with what life throws her way. Yeah, most definitely. And I think one of the cool things, Karen, was it was syndicated. So you can watch it. It would be on all times of the day. And, you know, like I said, I remember my mother was watching it and I'd be like, Mom, can you turn this off? I, You know, I want to watch something else. But, but after like the 
third episode, I found myself getting into it. And they were really like the producers, you know, the the networks and things of that nature. They did a great job because they aired it in the summer, I remember. And that got a lot of the audience watching it. And it, it kind of had like a summer feeling to it, the show. And I just felt like that that was so cool because it did really well in syndication. Because, again, if you couldn't see it, say, five o'clock in the evening, they might show at 11 o'clock in the morning on another channel. So you always got to see it in some capacity. And I mean, I just remember like you were really popular from that 1986 to 1989 stretch where like, I mean, you were one of those, you know, teen idols that people really admired and stuff. Even though you weren't a teen, you know, there were so many people that just loved that character. Well, I was in a bikini every day of my life on that show. And thankfully we also um, had the young storyline because on it, first of all, thank you for all your kind words. Um, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily know how we landed with audiences at times. You know, I've talked to people over the years about it and always appreciate that anybody watched the show, much less numbers of people having watched that show. Um, but um, we had a lot going on back then trying to find our way because we were doing something different. Um, and I think ultimately um, because we had the younger storyline where my niece was living with us for those many of you who did not watch that show, um, they needed to make sure that they had that 15, 16 year old energy going on. And they did a lot of that, which was great. And then Moondoggy, my husband and I became the brunt of some of the jokes at times, which seemed to, to work, you know, with the younger generation rolling their eyes, like, Oh, Aunt Gidget, you know, kind of thing. Um, but we were a colorful show, a certainly energetic. We, were silly and um we that was a really happy set like when i think back I, most sets for me are happy just because we're all doing what we love to do and it's a privilege again but but that show you know we were filming at the beach which was hard for us um in full body makeup but the crew were they were having a great time during lunch they'd just jump in the ocean um and it was you know, it was a, 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 f a celebration. We were always just laughing and enjoying ourselves. And hopefully that, that shows because technically we were shooting out of sequence and I won't bore you with how we shot that show, but um, I will say that we shot five shows in three weeks, just completely out of sequence, meaning that if we were at the beach, any scene that took place at a beach in those five shows, we just filmed one after another. And then when we moved to Warner Brothers at the time, which is where we shot, if we were in the bedroom, any scenes out of five scripts that took place in the bedroom, we shot one after another. So there was no continuity in most television shows, in every television show that I'm aware of, give or take a few, you might not shoot in sequence the way it actually plays out on camera, but you're only shooting one show at a time. So you're only focused on what's happening in that one show, that storyline. For us, you know, I usually just changed my bathing suit and smiled and went out there and did my best and hoped that it all came together at the end because it was hard to have any, you know, through line there. And the thing too, Karen, that, um, you know, when you're getting stardom like that, what fans sometimes don't understand, I think they do as they get older, but not at the moment, is that it's not about just making an episode. You've got to do all those promotional events. I mean, you got to, you know, promote the show. So you got to do the magazine articles, the, you know, all the other stuff that comes with it. You got to greet and meet people and things like that. So you're constantly busy doing this one show. And it's not just about making the episodes. You're constantly trying to promote the show as well. So you're always, you know, working throughout the day. Yes. Um, it was a particularly exhausting show 
for me in particular also because what you're saying is so right on i appreciate your you know awareness of that in this case you know there are many many shows where it's very much an ensemble and that's not to say that Gidget wasn't an ensemble. It absolutely was. But there was more pressure on me playing that title character. And because I had these four, we call them Gidget overs uh, instead of voiceovers, but these four little snippets throughout each episode where it was just me on, on camera as these different characters narrating what was going on. And then, yes, there were things like, you know, doing interviews at lunch and, and promoting the show. Um, if we had music in the show, we might, you know, have to run and record some music. There were a few episodes where I was lucky enough to get to sing in them. And Dean Butler, who played Moondoggy. Um, oh, and Cindy Penny also sang in the show. Um, and um, it was crazy. Plus, we were shooting in in the winter mostly, um, so not during the summer, and we had less sunlight. So, you know, our call time was something like 4.30 in the morning every day so that we were in makeup, in body makeup, ready to go the minute the sun was up because we were going to lose that sun by, you know, yeah. six o'clock, seven, six, five o'clock in the winter, whenever time the sun goes down, you know. Yeah, absolutely, so much pressure. I'm very unclear as to how I survived it, but I loved it. You know, again, I it's one of those times where I just think, wow, that that was an amazing experience. I think it's funny in life sometimes where when I'm talking, let's say, to you and you're playing back to me things in my career, it brings it all back. But on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, I'm just here trying to get through the day like everybody else. And I forget that, oh, gosh, that was amazing that I got through that. And I'm proud of myself that I, you know, did the best I could in those moments. And, and oh, yeah, that was wonderful experience. Like, it's weird. It's weird because actors, if we're lucky enough, get to see periods of our lives played out on camera. So it's sort of like home movies, but you're not really yourself, but you see yourself in different times of your life. And it's both frightening and interesting and fabulous all at the same time. So it's weird. And one thing that I always, you know, could tell when somebody's show is popular and when the actor is popular is the different things you see them do. And some of them will be on Hollywood squares or you know, Celebrity Jeopardy. And you got the opportunity during Gidget to be on a great show that I loved called Win, Lose, or Draw. And oh. such a phenomenal show. And it became so popular. I think eventually they changed the name to Pictionary. But what a great show that was. And I remember like right away, um, she's introducing you and she's saying from my girl Gidget or whatever. So right there is like validation that you know that your character was really getting over with uh, the audience. Well, in that period of time, you know, they, it was an interesting, um, from a business perspective, from the studio's perspective, because it was produced for syndication. That was the first time in television history that they were producing television that would air at a different time in every city. It was bought by separate television stations. It wasn't a network show. And so in certain markets, I think it was more successful than others. Um, and had we gone longer, we were set to go another year. And then there was a complete overhaul at Columbia Pictures Television, and we were sadly canceled. Um, so there was like this brief window where, you know, we were potentially popular and and our publicity department was you know getting us on I know Dean Butler and I did Hollywood squares together we were in a square together one time and um and win lose or draw was like so much fun except that I saw it for the first time in 30 years and all I could think of is what was that outfit what was I wearing I was like, I don't know what that I think I think the wardrobe department for Gidget gave me 
clothes and they wanted me to look gidgety. And our whole thing, wardrobe wise, was very brightly colored things and scarves in our heads and very, um, you know, cartoony kind of wardrobe in certain ways. Um, it was very 80s. But yes, it, the opportunity to do those kinds of shows as a byproduct of having done Gidget was just wonderful. And I also, you know, over the years, because of some of the shows, have been um, really touched by doing a bunch of different charity events too. That's another wonderful, you know, uh, byproduct of being on a show because you're asked to do celebrity, we're using that term loosely, but celebrity tennis, you know, tournaments and ski tournaments and golf and to raise money for all these wonderful, wonderful charities. And over the years, um, having that opportunity also takes me back to, you know, that beginning desire of social work and psychology and trying to give back as much as I possibly can. And I've loved those experiences of helping to raise money for various causes. And Right. Uh, one of them that you, I didn't mean to cut you off, but one of them that you really have done a great job with, which I really applaud you for, is the mistreatment of animals, because that has been a problem that's been going on for decades and still going on. And I mean, you, every time I see those commercials and they show those animals, yeah. it breaks your heart. So just talk about that cause, because I know it's very near and dear to your heart. Yeah, I always say to myself, I know this to be true. If I were driving to a set and there was an injured animal in the road, I wouldn't, I, that would be my first priority. I mean, that always brings home to me. It's, it is probably, I, I love acting, but there's something in me and so many people have it. it it's not, the compassion is one thing. And I, I love anybody that loves animals and that wants the best for them. Hallelujah. I, for some reason, am driven to try as one little person to make a difference. And somehow it's manifested itself in me being a crazy cat lady, to be honest. I love all animals. If I could, I'd have monkeys and, you know, goats and sheep and dogs and cats and turtles and hamsters. Um, but with cats, I'm so, I've always been obsessed with cats and fascinated by them and the problem of overpopulation with feral cats. Um, the only way to prevent it is, as far as I'm concerned, and many of the rescues that I work with, is to trap them, get them spayed or neutered, and then release, hopefully with, you know, with somebody that feeds. There are many people that feed feral cats out there, um, myself included. But um, it, it, I'm driven by it. I'm haunted by, you know, the overpopulation problem. I'm devastated by what goes on in our shelter system. And I can't even imagine what a solution is because it's an overpopulation problem. And, um, you know, I don't need to get on a soapbox about that. I don't, that's not fun for your viewers in any way, shape or form. But yes, it's something I'm incredibly passionate about. And I think we all forget and this is me on a soapbox, um, if we each just make a difference in one animal's life, in two animals' lives, somehow, imagine how much better that whole problem could be. And whatever that is, you know, um, but there's also, you know, just different perspectives of how people view animals. And I know from a really early age, I just was drawn drawn to them, found comfort in them, found a depth in them that I didn't have with many people, to be honest. And animals never let you down. Remember that. <laughs> and, you, you know, like it, animals? Oh, I, I mean, I love dogs and they give you unconditional love. Let me tell you, they never let you down. And the thing about animals that I'm always taken with, especially after a loss of an animal, you on, you can only communicate with an animal by feeling that animal like you you don't have a language i mean you do talk to your animals but 
they don't talk back. They show you how they're feeling and what they want, but you really have to feel an animal. And so you're forced to communicate on a level that we as people are not in any way forced to, to do. We don't necessarily have to go deep with our fellow humans unless we want to. And words sometimes mask what's really going on underneath. So uh, there's something really pure about relation, our relationships with animals. So, yeah. Definitely is. And uh, like I said, I really do applaud the work you do because I think it's important. And that, you know, really stands out about you as a person that, you know, the cause that you you take with this and how you want to make it better for them. And I really do, you know, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That means a lot. That really does. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate so I, ironically, Karen, um, Gidget yes. ends and you do another updated <laughs> version of a show. You get the part in A Very Brady Christmas, which came out in December of 1988. And it was, you know, so cool because for me as a Brady Bunch fan, I had only seen them as kids. You know, I saw the Brady Brides. That was like, you know, they tried that for a little bit. But now we see Greg Brady with a wife. And, you know, it was so weird to me because I was like 11 or 12 years old. And I'm like, Greg has a wife. But what a job you did playing Nora Brady. And I'll never forget that whole episode, you know, the son, the, the son Kevin on the show. Um, I forget the actor's name. I do apologize. But he shy the entire episode. Then he sees his mother. And finally, we hear him talk. And, you know, <laughs> just so cool, that whole movie. So just talk about doing the movie and then eventually doing a, you know, a reboot series of the Brady Bunch? Well, first of all, I didn't consciously set out, oh, there we all are. I didn't set out to do every remake of every old <laughs> TV show. <laughs> um, but it was funny. Um, and also, again, you know, these are iconic shows for my generation. Um, I you know, I watched Sally Fields Gidget and the Brady Bunch, um, I probably watched a little bit later than the years that I was watching Gidget. I, I um, but obviously, I, you know, like everybody else, it was the Brady Bunch and um, getting cast in that and showing up on that set was terribly surreal. You know, First of all, they reconstructed the entire house with the stairway and it was updated, but it was still, you know, again, iconic images that, you know, very clearly Brady Bunch vibe. Florence Henderson, Robert Reed, you know, meeting the Bradys. Um, it was exciting. It was also, um, I've talked about this before and it was actually kind of a funny thing for us, the Brady spouses, we called ourselves. Um, Jerry Hauser, Martha Quinn, myself, um, we show up on the set. They they were a well-oiled machine, the Bradys. Yeah. They worked together. They grew up together. They, you know, they could have done this in their sleep. They knew each other so well. And so in a weird way, it was almost like that, you know, that question about being a guest star on a set, you have to figure out how you fit into their already existing energy. And everybody was terribly welcoming. Um, Florence Henderson, as you would imagine, is maternal and generous and, and lovely. And Robert Reed was there to sort of be the father. And, and you know, they, they, everyone sort of very much had their roles. And, um, you know, working with Barry Williams was was a joy, even with that mustache that he had. Yeah. <laughs> he had that very 80s, that very uh, fun mustache. And um, that picture that you keep flashing was just recently because Barry, of course, was, if I'm sure most people, even if they didn't watch Dancing with the Stars, sort of got yeah. wind of the fact that Barry was on Dancing with the Stars. But um, we had a great time, you know, that we, I, the thing about acting is no matter what set you're showing up on, it's the same process. You know, you are there to bring as much reality and to embody this character as much as you possibly can and to connect with your fellow actors and, and live in the moment and make it come alive as best you can. And it really, you know, it doesn't, 
matter whether you're doing Gidget or the Brady Bunch or Steven Spielberg's movie, and I'm not in any way putting down Gidget or the Brady Bunch, but what I'm saying is it's all the, the same process um, for us. And so making all of that believable, um, you know, it, 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 it just sort of fell into place for us and was really quite fun. And I was grateful that we got to do the series after A Very Brady Christmas. We were picked up. Unfortunately, we were canceled after six episodes. We were bought for 13 by Paramount, but we didn't do well at all, which we can talk about in a second. But, um, but in A Very Brady Christmas, unfortunately, my character goes home to her own family. So I'm only in it in the beginning and at the end, and I miss all the good stuff that happened in between. But I was happy to reunite with the Bradys at the end and realize I wanted to be with my family for Christmas, my immediate family. So that yeah. was quite fun. But we had, a, again, a really happy set. We laughed so hard. Um, and you know, the thing is, Karen, um, for years, Robert Reed always got this bad reputation because supposedly he didn't like doing the show. He, he was more into like the Shakespeare type of uh, TV, but here's the one thing that I admire about him and that I've really found a new appreciation for him as a person, even though the, he may not have liked the work they were giving him. He never took it out on those kids ever. He, those kids loved him like a father. And I think the biggest reason he always came back for every reunion and stuff like that was for, you know, Florence and those kids. Like, I think like that he genuinely loved them. And that said a lot to me about him as a person, because he, ne that's what a, a man should do is, you know, whatever problems you're having with scripts and things like that, you don't take it out on the other cast and he never did. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that you bring it up that up in particular, because I'm always quite careful not to touch on that. But since you did, which I'm somewhat fascinated with, because I, I, I'm not aware that that was complete public knowledge, but you know a lot about a lot of things there, Mike. Um, he wasn't particularly happy doing the Brady Bunch. It was fluff for him. He did think of himself um, as a much more seasoned actor, and um, he's he's a wonderful actor and. Um, I think at times he wasn't madly in love with some of the storylines he, you know, but I agree with you. W what we're doing is what we're doing. We're doing the Brady Bunch and there there's great merit to that and great joy in doing that as well. And, and he did not let his personal um, feelings at times about the show interfere with his work once we were working. Um, you know, he did fight for certain things in terms of the storylines or felt like, you know, maybe that's, that's silly. Why, why are we doing that kind of thing? But I think that's true on a lot of sets too. I mean, we had that on Gidget a little bit too, where Dean Butler, who had already done Little House on the Prairie and was, um, you know, had a great deal of serious experience, um, would fight for certain things on the Gidget set, but we really had to take a look at the fact that we were doing Gidget. It was fluff, you know, yeah. Brady Bunch, not as much fluff, which was our downfall <laughs> because we were trying at that time to make it a bit more serious. People had trouble. Marsha was an alcoholic. There were money, you know, we were going down a road because 30 something was so popular at the time. Um, and that was a show where there was a lot of drama. And I think they were sort of not mirroring that show in particular, but just trying to make the Brady, the Brady's a bit, a bit more, I don't know. I also, yeah. I also think too, that Dallas was starting to, you know, reach the end of its uh, peak. And I think they felt like maybe the Brady Bunch Friday nights, eight o'clock right before Dallas comes on they could kind of get Dallas viewers back in some way, but it just, I always felt like putting it on Friday nights and you're right about like how they, you know, did the more serious things because the Brady Bunch did serious episodes, but there was also a lot of comedy in there too, that they kind of left out in this series. Yeah. We went down a road that we should never have gone down. They want, audiences didn't want to see, they wanted to see the Brady Bunch. Yeah. 
you know, I have to put on my glasses because is it getting too dark in here? I don't have any lights on. Is this okay? I know we're rolling. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm going to keep my glasses on for a second so I can see you. Um, hello. Um, yeah, the Brady Bunch. I think if we had attempted to do the Brady Bunch as the same energy as the Brady Bunch originally, I mean, if we had done the Brady's with the same energy that, that the Brady Bunch had done, you know, Previously, I think we would have gone in a better direction. Absolutely. Yeah, most definitely. Um, another series that I, you know, really enjoyed you in um, was, of course, you know, Jane Johnson, uh, Hollywood Safari. And uh, again, I thought that was a tremendous show. You did a tremendous job on that. And, um, you know, I love Wait, did you actually see that show? Nobody saw that show. Oh, yeah. I Listen, I've watched. Listen, I, I like the shows that maybe don't last more than two or three years because I think a lot of times, you know, I think of a show, I don't want to get off topic, but I used to love oh, a show please. called Picket Fences and that only lasted a few years and that was just tremendous TV. I think sometimes some of the shows that people don't watch are the shows they're missing out on because that, that show was really fun, you know, and I think you did about, I'd say probably 25 to 30 episodes and I, I wish it would have got more life because it was a really good show. Oh my God. That means, I mean, first of all, I love you for that. Second of all, that show for me, it, it, and nobody other than you evidently really saw that show. It was on Animal Planet. Yeah. Um, and we, it was a show where I played a veterinarian and um, Sam Jones played my husband. He was a park ranger, but one of our businesses as a family is that we rented out not rented out, but we 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 had animals that were trained for film and television. That was one of our our businesses, and so we were everything was about the animals on that show. So I was in complete heaven, and every scene I did, there was a little capuchin monkey on my shoulder, or if I was vacuuming, I had you know a chimp on the vacuum, and we had everything from tigers and, and big cats to, you know, dogs and cats and llamas and giraffe. No, we didn't have a giraffe. That's absolutely not true. We didn't have a giraffe. But, you know, it was, it was heaven. It was heaven. And we had such fun. It was also one of those shows where it was really an amazing experience. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a show that I wish, you know, the Animal Planet Channel gave you know, more of a chance. I think like, listen, I get it that you live and die with ratings, but sometimes it takes a show one or two seasons to really, you know, get momentum, you know, and when you don't give it enough time, that's when you kind of miss out because eventually like, look at Seinfeld, that show didn't do well in the ratings. The first, yeah, it took you, know, you, have, you have to give a, uh, give it a lot of time. And I just wish they would have um, gave that show more life than they did. I do too, but I was definitely grateful for what we did get to do. And um, I, I think also what happened, things happen, you know, internally, like with that network, they, they were trying to do an hour long drama and then they just stopped that kind of programming and went more towards Animal Planet. It now does mostly reality based shows having to do with animals. So they were, they were trying something that, you know, didn't really work for them ultimately, but we had a blast doing it. So that was great. Right. And Karen, you know, one of the things too is I had never realized how funny you could be on TV. And I remember like um it was like a short movie. I think it was called The Love Suckers. And you were ah. hysterical in that. I mean you just looked like such a like evil but funny person. Like your part was so great for that. So just talk about that a little bit because those short films, you know, that they're not long, but they are a lot of fun, I'm sure. Oh my gosh, that one was terribly, terribly fun. Um, so actually this came about, Jim Palatano uh, is somebody who wrote this short film. He, uh, I met him actually at an autograph show um, and he had been a bit of a fan, which I was grateful for. And he talked to me about the short film and I was like, that sounds amazing. And then he, he um, had Eddie Deason, to play my husband, who's hilarious, Carrick, wonderful actor, but plays this sort of 
you know, doofy kind of character a lot in his career, and he does it beautifully. It's not who he is as a person by any means. And then Larry Thomas, the soup Nazi from Seinfeld. So it was a really wonderful little cast. And we shot it all in one day, I think, if I can, if my memory serves me. And, um, you know, we just played and, and shot it and had fun. And when I saw it, I thought, I I liked it. I didn't know if I was going to like it, but when I see it played back, I mean, you know, it was obviously a spoof, uh, you know, and I, I don't want to give it away, but I'm, you know, you can certainly find it out there. The love suckers. Um, but kudos to Jim Palatano and, and to my fellow actors. We had a really funny time. It was fun. So thank you for knowing that one too. Boy, you're pulling stuff. You're pulling stuff out of a hat there, Mike. <laughs> one, of the, one of the, you know, famous phrases that we tend to say a lot in our lives, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. You actually got to be in a miniseries called Keeping Up With The Joneses. And I mean, I love when you did the miniseries because one of the things that is kind of a downer for a fan, especially myself, is when you see an actor or actress on a TV series, then that series gets canceled and then you don't know what happens to them. And then you just happen to watch uh, one of those, you know, especially NBC was famous for doing a lot of movies of the week, ABC. And then you get to see these mini series and you say, oh, wow, Karen, you know, Karen Richmond is here, you know, Nora Brady, you get to see that person again. So, I mean, I'm sure those mini series had to be a lot of fun to do as well. You know, again, yes, everything to me, everything is fun. Um, you know, just l somebody yell action and I'm excited and <laughs> happy. And, and I, you know, being on a set thrills me to no end. So yeah, I mean, getting to do a mini series um, where you have more than one episode is always quite fun. I, I also got to do American uh, Crime Story yeah. where I shot a few episodes. Unfortunately, only one aired. So I had shot two others, but they they I was cut from those two. I played one of the characters' mothers, and it wasn't an integral part of the story ultimately, so it was cut. But having some continuity and continuation, you know, with the cast um, and getting to show up more than once is always phenomenal. So, Mike, and I feel like I need to turn a light on because it's getting dark here, and I'm sinking into the abyss yeah. here. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah but, you know. Not a problem at all. Let me see yeah. what I have going on here. Don't go away, viewers. Here I come. I'm trying hard. Wait, let's see. Does this make any difference whatsoever? Yeah, yeah. I could. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, my God. That's so scary. But, yes, that's so much better. And, you okay. know, and, um, a very Brady Christmas. But you've gotten to do some Christmas movies. And you recently did one in uh, – the year 2023, a royal Christmas holiday. Talk about that because oh, it's airing right now. Yeah, um, is but I don't know how quickly. Okay, I'm back. On, uh, where can we find it? Is it on? It's on a uh, great American Family Channel. Okay. Um, forgive me as I'm grooming my hair. Um, I I was lucky enough to do two Christmas movies this year. One was Christmas with the Foxes, and yeah. that already aired. That was on Fox Nation, which didn't even know that existed. <laughs> no political affiliations. We're not getting into any politics here. Um, and then this Great American Family Channel movie, um, A Royal, uh, what is it? A Royal Christmas Holiday. Is that what it's called? Yeah, A Royal Christmas Holiday, yeah. Thank you very much. My brain doesn't always function the way it has to. Um, that was shot actually in February of this year um, in Buffalo, New York, it was absolutely freezing. Um, and I played the mom of uh, the lead character, Brittany Underwood, who is the queen. She's a goddess of all these, I mean, she directs and she writes and she stars in so many Lifetime movies and Christmas movies, but, um, and uh, I'm her mom and she brings home this very attractive prince <laughs> and the rest ensues and life unfolds and they live happily ever after. But getting to do Christmas movies when it's nowhere near Christmas is such fun. 
you know, because it's usually hot out, although in this case it wasn't. Um, and uh, yeah, fun, festive. It's it's really quite fun. And it must be fun for you, Karen, when you get to kind of play, you know, obviously when you're the lead part, it's great. But when you get to play these supporting characters and I think, um, you know, and stalk, stalked by my doctor, you got to be the therapist in that. And, you know, you weren't on it a whole lot, but you were on it enough where like, you know, you play an important part on that movie. So when you get to do different roles like that, the most important thing that I look at is you're working and, you know, life didn't, work didn't end for you after Gidget. You continued to work and you've been working for almost 40 years now. So, I mean, that's, <laughs> the, that's gotta be the thing that uh, you're proud of more than anything else is that you're still working. Um. Yes, I think I'm always surprised. You know, there's always this feeling like, will I work again? And it's not, it's not necessarily coming from an insecure place as much as it's just the nature of the beast sort of thing. I mean, I know I will work again. Um, I will just make it happen. I won't accept anything less, but I'm very, very grateful. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, what I'm loving is that I'm getting to play characters now. You know, I'm playing grandma. Um, I, I just did a movie that aired this year, uh, Lifetime, A Nurse to Die For. I love the titles. They're the most hilarious titles ever. Um, but got to play this glorious role of, you know, a young grandma, but really fun, interesting stuff. And I end up, you know, killing somebody in it. I'm doing a lot of killing lately. Got to play one um, where I hold a gun on my son's girlfriend. You know, that just all this fun stuff that Gidget, Ingenue Karen Richmond never would have gotten in her younger days. And now I'm getting, you know, to play characters where, you know, certainly I'm not the cute, bubbly actress anymore. <laughs> It's funny too, you brought up a nurse to die for. I was going to bring that up, but I remember watching it and I'm like, oh, I don't want to hate her. I've liked her my whole life. And like, I was hating that character because that character, I was like, oh, I want them to get her. So, I mean, that is when you know you're a great actress though, because, um, you know, I'll, I'll compare uh, Ada, Ada Totoro. Her character on The Sopranos, everybody could not stand her character, Janice. But because they couldn't stand her, that's how great of an actress she is. Because if you see her, outside of Sopranos, she's the funniest and nicest person. So that's really like what makes a great actor because you have to make people believe that you're this, uh, you know, great person or horrible person. Well, listen, it's so much more fun to play the evil character than it is to play the, the sweet wholesome. I mean, at least for me, it is to play against type. And, and if I'm anywhere near believable doing it, then I, have somewhat succeeded in in my goal and I appreciate it because um it's it's in us you know and and the nicest people in the world become serial killers you know I mean awful but you know again human nature and the light and dark of, of humans and and the different sides of us and getting to play some more interesting aspects for me has been really really fun and I think that's one of the wonderful things about acting is wherever you are in your life, there's a character for where you are. It's never, oh, I'm too old or I'm too thin or fat or skinny or pretty or ugly. Like, you know, I, whoever, and I, I don't, that sounded really insulting, but I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, as an actor, you know, you don't get roles because you're not pretty enough. You don't get roles because you're too pretty. You don't get roles because you're too old. You don't get roles because you're too young. You know, like it's this constant, you're too thin, you're too fat, you're too this, you're too that. Um, but the truth is there is a role for wherever and whoever you are. Um, and I think that's the wonderful thing about acting is we're representing and bringing to life people and we're all different. And um yeah, so it's interesting now. I, I I'm excited to see what comes next. I always am. I feel like I feel like I'm reading a book and I'm in the middle of it. It's like, 
okay, now what? What do I do next? <laughs> I, but I know you're probably tired of it because, um, you know, you did it, you know, 30 some odd years ago. But I really believe if they came out with Gidget today, you could play it today and you could be that grandmother and you could do that stuff. And it would be so cool to resurrect that Gidget series. I couldn't agree with you more. I literally did a podcast a, a couple of weeks ago and we were absolutely talking about this very thing. Like, you know, first of all, why have they not done another Gidget? Yeah. I, a lot of it has a movie, to do Even a movie, you know, something. But I really believe that you could go out there tomorrow and play, you know, Francine like you did before and play the same Gidget character and be the grandmother. And you kind of, I could look at you with that, you know, comedy you would bring to it. You'd kind of be that good cop and your daughter or son, whatever, would be the you know, bad cop because they got to be the parent and it would just be so cool to watch that. And I really think that that's something I hope in time they, you know, entertain because it would be so much fun. I hope so too. I, you know, it's, it's definitely politics. It's, it's who owns the rights. I believe I know the answer to that. And, um, you know, there's things behind the scenes that might make it difficult, but, I can't see a reason why they would not have already done, especially a young for for teenagers, like a reenactment of Sally Fields Gidget, not even doing a geriatric grandma Gidget. Although I think grandma Gidget would be hilarious. And I'm definitely going to put that out into the universe. Grandma Gidget, grandma Gidget, I want to play her. Um, I think it would be fun. Everybody. Yeah, it would be. And I bet we could, bring back Moondoggy, Dean Butler, and I bet we could bring back a bunch of people. But, um, you know, again, um, it's something that I'm, I am I was going to spend a little time and energy and just sort of investigate just to see, you know, where the, the powers that be stand on something like that. But I love that you would even think that way. I would love that. Um, you know, I would love them to even do one and just have a little cameo. I don't even have to, you know, depending on, I just think it would be fun to bring her back and see where she is now since the character has had a very long history and, you know, that's, that's across the ages when you think of, you know, starting in the fifties and sixties and, and that's a, that's a long life for a character. So. Yeah. You know, I, that, hey, you know, like they say, never say never, but, uh, before we go, Karen, uh, I know it's hard to pick one thing, but in your career, what would you say you're most proud about? I mean, what's the proudest thing about your career that you could uh, say? Wow. That's an interesting question, Mike. What am I most proud of in terms of a project? You know, if we take away, like, how it was received. I have to be honest, some of my proudest acting moments have occurred not on camera, have occurred in acting class over the years, um, you know, getting to play things that I was never asked to play on camera. If I had to name one thing though, um, I think I would have to choose Gidget, not because Gidget was such a great success, because sadly it wasn't, but because what was asked of me was, um, I had to continually show up for myself and for the project in a way that was highly pressured um, at times and still maintain this very um, light and airy, positive, perky persona, um, it was, there was a lot on my shoulders. And I was very proud of myself that I was able to carry that off. Um, so that had nothing to do with how it was received or the final product. It was more the process of what I went through to do that show. Um, honestly, Whenever I'm asked to do anything, Mike, I always am relieved that I got through it, pray that I did the best possible work I could in that moment. And there's this very weird actory thing where I'm filled with self-doubt and pride all at the same time, because it's always sort of 
even though it's just showbiz, there is a certain amount of pressure, no matter what you're doing. They're paying a lot of money to that cast, that crew, the producers, you know, everybody, we're there to get a job done. And every time I'm able to do what they asked of me and hope that I do it decently, I feel a sense of pride that I got through it. Um, I also feel horrified and wish I could have done it 20 more times and done it better. But um, yeah, I, I, I think I would have to say Gidget only because it was the title character and um, it was a lot in retrospect. Yeah, but I wouldn't look at it. I know you say it wasn't successful, but I never look at it that way because there was an audience that you still have a following today with that character. Um, it was popular when it was Aaron and you're still working in 2023. And when you think about it, Gidget is what really kind of got you onto the scene. So you have to Gidget as being the start of so many great things in your career. Right. I agree. And I, please don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting it was a failure. It, it wasn't, I, I, I'm, you know, what's success? I'm, I'm sort of measuring it against, again, these, these mega series that went on to become, you know, become legendary that are household names that are going to rerun for the rest of our lives. Um, do I wish that Gidget had been more in that vein? Of course, you know, I wish it was just rerunning now anywhere and it won't because uh, the music rights were too expensive. Back in those days, they licensed music they they licensed the music for five years and it was Beatles songs and Beach Boy songs. And once those five years were up, it's just way too expensive and it's never going to really rerun, which is sad. I would have loved it to have been running on Nick at night or some, you know, streaming service. So um, I mean, the tough part about it, that's why uh, it took so long for shows like the wonder years. I mean, you know, that's why a show like Brooklyn Bridge can't air because, you know, music plays a big part. And that's the unfortunate thing. You know so much about so much, Mike. How is it that you know so much? I don't I want to interview you now. And I know we probably don't have time, but you're going to have to tell me how you know so much. You uh, the fan, uh, you know, Karen, uh, I grew up in the 80s. I was a young kid in the 80s that I was a teenager in the 90s, loved the 90s. You know, that was the time. You know, you mentioned Martha Quinn before. I mean, I loved MTV. I mean, it oh, was, God. you know, it was what I grew up with. And I don't love MTV now, but I loved it back in, you know, 1980. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I really do appreciate you giving me some time today. It was very nice of you. And I congratulate you, like I said, on what's been a wonderful career. It really has been. And for me, it was a real honor to get to sit down with you today and reminisce about your career. And I just applaud all the work you do and congratulations. And thank you for giving me some time today. Oh, Mike, thank you. You're so warm and welcoming and knowledgeable. And it was a great pleasure to talk with you. And thank you for, for bringing back a lot of beautiful memories for me. And looking back, that's, that's actually, I feel a little better about myself right now. <laughs> oh, I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. And thank Thank you. Well, there you have it, folks. You know, I talked to you about Karen Richmond. You know, we went over her career today and what a career it's been. And she has done some many things in her career, wonderful things and things that, you know, we wish we could do in our lifetime. But the thing that stands out to me the most is who she is as the person. Look at the things that she's done in her spare time. She's trying to make people better at what they do. She's done all these great projects for young kids trying to help them in any way she can. She's never forgotten the most important thing, that she's a human being first and an actor second. You know, you talk about, you could say a lot of things about Karen Richmond and, you know, words to describe her, but I think that this phrase says it best. She's everything you want a person to be. For In the Spotlight, I'm Mike Kenichi saying, good night, everyone.